Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Hot Rod Bob, and you've got gas. It's a Monday morning, and I'm going to call it Movie Monday. Why? Well, the history of movie theaters. It includes something that us car guys really enjoyed, and that is drive-in movies. Now, it wasn't just car guys. It was families. Now, oops, camera's moving. All right, now, if you look back at the history, according to the Smithsonian Institute, the authority on history, drive-in theaters officially began in 1933. Richard Hollingshead opened up the first commercial drive-in theater, and he developed it because of a family situation. Apparently, his mother would like to go to movies. The problem was she was, um, as one might say, a little larger than the average person, and she didn't fit in an average movie theater seat. So Richard came up with an idea. He took a projector, mounted it on the hood of his car, hung some mm -hmm. sheets in the backyard, focused the camera on those sheets, and voila, mom sat in the car and could watch a movie. Well, it took him a while to perfect this, and get it going, but in 1933, Richard Hollingshead opened up the first drive-in theater, not in sunny Southern California, where the car was exciting and fun and we drove all over the place, but in Camden, New Jersey, where it's cold in the winter and you can't do this kind of thing. But he did, and he opened it up. It was a seasonal thing, so you figure from about May, April, late April, early May through September... You could go to a drive-in movie. The cost, well, it was 25 cents for the car and 25 cents for each person in the car. The billing was, well, you can go to a theater with the kids and not worry about them disturbing the people sitting next to you because you were the people sitting next to you. They were in your car. They were social distancing before it became today's fad. So, drive-in theaters, well, they've got a medical reason now to come back. The problem is, is where do you put them? They had massive amounts of land, and I can remember going to the Pickwick Theater in beautiful downtown Burbank. It's now a shopping mall. The Van Nuys Drive-In, it was right across the street from the elementary school I went to and met my good friend Ron Dasher, who we're still friends with. And he lived right behind the theater. The school was right across the street from the theater. The Van Nuys Drive-In, one of Pacific Theater's premier drive-in theaters. It's gone. I don't even know what it is. I don't go to that part of town anymore. There was the Sepulveda Drive-In that we went to. That was a great one because it was $2 per car load. Right. We would stuff people in the car. Now, the other theaters, well, the other Pacific drive-ins charge you by the person. So you paid a buck and a half or so to get in, but we always took the car with the biggest trunk. Mm-hmm. Put the bodies in the trunk. So we'd sneak in with guys in the trunk and park indiscriminately, and as soon as it got dark enough, no one paid too much attention, we'd open the trunk, let out a couple from the, and put them in, in it great cheap date. It, it was fun. Now, we've got a lot of stories about drive-in theaters, and I'm sure you do too, if you went to them. Now, I can remember my parents having a Nash sedan, and the front seat folded down and made the interior a big bed. Heck, we could watch the movie like we were lying in bed at home. It was fun. We'd go to the one in, I forget what city it was in, but we lived in a place called East Patterson, New Jersey, and it was just up the road on Highway 46, and we'd go there. But it was cool. I remember drive-ins real well from about the age of five is when we started going to them because, well, before that, we lived in New York City. There were no drive-ins in New York City. There was no room for them. But the drive-in theater has gone away because, well... The land has become worth more than the income generated by the theater. But there were so many here in the Southern California area, and they were a regular place to go and date. How many of you, raise your hand, have gone to these drive-ins and fogged up the windows in a car? Yeah, I have, yeah. And what were you doing? Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have. Uh, oh, shh, don't tell anybody. We were young and foolish and eager to... Yeah, we did that, too. Anyway, and then there was the uh, movies we'd see. You You had to remember the title. You had to watch at least the beginning of it, because when you got home, your parents would ask you, how was the movie? And you had to talk intelligently about the movie. Um, you, you did see the movie, right? Drive-in movies, that's, that's what they were for. So you could drive in and see a movie. All right, now, the things that have changed, though, is when we went to the drive-in movies, they had a speaker box. The speaker box was on a pole. The angle of the parking area was upward, so that when you park there, you had an angle to look and see, and you would see over the cars in front of you, they would change the angle of the whole property. You would take the box, you'd put it in your car, hang it from the window, and you can control the volume. Today, that's not necessary. They broadcast over a limited frequency, FM frequency, and you just turn the radio on. Now, there's a problem with that, though, with brand news type cars, and we found that out last night. There's no key. There's no accessory section on your ignition switch because the ignition switch is now just a button. Well, we were in my wife's car because, frankly, it's the only one that's got a radio besides the Corvette, and we didn't take the Corvette out. Figured it would be too cramped and uncomfortable to sit in, and I don't think it's got an accessory switch either. But regardless, what we did is we parked, we shut the car off, we hit the button just like the manual says, and it said, automatic accessory power on. Cool. Didn't last long. It would shut off to conserve battery power. Now, luckily, this drive-in figured this out, and they had huge speakers alongside the screen. We could still hear it. We rolled down the windows. It was a little chilly last night, which was kind of interesting. Cool. <clears throat> we had dinner. There was a truck that made dinner for us. We had that. We went back to the car. We sat in the car. One thing that's better than the previous times of me going to drive-ins is cars now have real cup holders. So we had some place to put our drinks. We couldn't get the seats back very far, but same situation. Steering wheel's in the way of the driver. Passenger had plenty of room. But we got to see a movie sitting in our car, relaxed. If it got a little chilly, start the car up, run the heater. If it's too warm because it's summertime and you're at a drive-in, start the car up and put the air conditioning on. Either way, you sat in comfort. If you wanted to have a conversation, you had a conversation. If you wanted a schmooze, yes, Roseanne, I was there with your mom last night. <laughs> and we, you know, we didn't do anything. But you could. And that's the problem with bucket seats today and the console right in the middle. You, you can't get close. So next time, we're taking out our 56 Chevy wagon with the bench seat. Now, it's got kind of cup holders in the glove box, provided you don't use too tall a cup. But it's got a bench seat. She gets to sit next to me. We can fog up the windows just like we did when we were kids. Mm. All right, maybe not just like we did when we were kids. I remember one time there was a guy that was tasked with having to go to each and every car that had fogged up windows and make sure they weren't doing anything necessary to fog up windows. Well, the windows were already fogged up. Guy, guess what they were doing? Luckily, never got caught doing anything that fogged up the windows. Seriously. But uh, drive-in theaters. They've been around for a long time. Now, the concept of showing movies outdoors wasn't novel. People often watch silent films on screens set up at the beaches or other places, boasting a, a abundance of sky around them, and uh, this was kind of neat. But it took Richard Hollingshead to make it an auto park for people to drive their cars in. First, he conceived the driving to, like I said, to appease his mom. That was about 1928. It took him until 1933 to figure out how to get this to work, and by the 1950s, 
these places were popping up almost everywhere. There were over 4,000 drive-in theaters all over the country that you could go to. And some of them had playgrounds in front of the screen, so you got there early. It was still daylight, because remember, they wouldn't start the movie until dusk at least. And then they'd start with the cartoons and the newsreels and things like that, just like you were in a regular theater. And the kids could play in these little playground areas. There was a cafeteria or an area where you could uh, buy pizza or burgers or hot dogs or popcorn and things like that. And it was a family event. It really was. And I can remember going with family and my mom and dad and go with cousins. And in high school, hey, it was a big thing. You could go out, have a date, go to a movie, have something to eat. You spent about 10 bucks. That was it. It was affordable fun, and it was great. Now, more than 75% of the drive-ins in the country were privately owned small businesses, <coughs> according to the National Theater Owners Association. But in California, we had Pacific Drive-Ins. That was a, a, an organization that owned a number of the drive-ins here in Southern California. And it was good. It was fun. The drive-ins are gone to nowadays because, well, the land. It's become more expensive to own the land. It's more expensive for the land than the income generated by a drive-in. So the drive-ins have gone away. I'm sure there's some someplace, but where are they? Honda Motor Corporation started a fund or a program just a few years ago to try and resurrect drive-in theaters. It was a good move on their part, but it didn't pay off because, well, again, the land. Where are you going to put these drive-ins? The land is too valuable. You're in the middle of homes. And one of the things was the people that live around the drive-ins who didn't necessarily want to hear the drive-ins didn't like the drive-ins being in their neighborhood. Of course, in the older days, the drive-ins were there before the houses. But, hey, what are you going to do? The drive-in theater. Lost part of Americana. A part I miss and a part... We recreated last night with one of our car clubs. We had a drive-in. It was on the rooftop of a Ford dealer in Oxnard, California, Ventura, California. And we had probably about 50 cars. Got to see Ford versus Ferrari. Good place to see it at a Ford dealership. Vista Ford, thank you very much. Tony Fiore and his staff putting on the event for us in our car club. We do appreciate it. All right, folks, you have a great day. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, the morning edition. Hi, right, Jay and Jay. we got Jay Thomas and Jay Black all watching this morning. Have a great day. I'm Hot Rod Bob. You've got gas, the morning edition, brought to you by Service Tech Equipment, the place to go for the equipment you need to work on your car. Service Tech, Valley Head Service, Irwindale Speedway, Irwindale Drag Strip, Get ready for Nitro Revival, having an Erwindale drag strip. All right, you guys have a great day. I'm Hot Rod Bob. I've got gas. We'll see you. Take care now.